Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to the UNFW Disability Innovation Institute's webinar on the Gene Equal Team on co-production. And this is being presented by Eva Stonadolva, Elizabeth Emma Palmer, Julie Lublinsk, and Sky Zaharat. And I'm Jackie Leach Scully, the director of the Institute, the DIIU, and I'm also, in fact, a member of the Gene Equal Team. I'm going to start by acknowledging the medical people of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the unceded land on which the UNFW Kensington campus sits, and the Camaragal people, who are the traditional custodians of the land where I am actually at the moment. And I pay my respects to elders past and present, extending my acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. As we share our knowledge and practices across our different communities, we also recognise the knowledge and experience that's embedded within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. A couple of housekeeping things before we start. If any of you audience members have any questions during the event, or if you're having difficulty and you can't use the Q&A function, then please email us at diiu at unsw.edu.au. The closed captions have been enabled on otter.ai and also they're available via the Zoom live transcription. And again, please contact us if you are not able to access them. We also have two Auslan interpreters and screening interpreters who will be visible on screen alongside the speakers. At the end of the presentation, the audience Q&A is going to be conducted via the Zoom Q&A function, which is at the, at the bottom of your screen if you're on a web browser or on a mobile device. So please post your questions here and they'll be passed on to the presenters during the Q&A session. You'll also be able to raise your hand to ask a question during the session if you prefer to do that. And I want briefly to say something about the Institute. The UNSW Disability Innovation Institute is a world first initiative focusing on disability research, education and knowledge exchange. All of the members of the DIIU take pride in undertaking work that's radically inclusive and that crosses disciplinary boundaries. The Institute's approach is to see disability not as a problem to be solved, but as an integral part of the human condition that's to be encountered and engaged with rather than feared. And as you'll learn today, the Gene Equal Project exemplifies the values and aims of the Institute in its approach to making genomic healthcare safe and inclusive for people with intellectual disability. Now I'm pleased to be able to introduce you now to some of the key team members on the project. Emma Palmer is a clinical genetics doctor at Sydney Children's Hospital and a researcher at UNSW. And her research aims to improve the patient journey for the 2 million Australians and 300 million people globally with a rare disease. Eva Trnadova works as a Professor of Special Education and Disability Studies at the School of Education at UNSW Sydney. She's the academic lead of research at the UNSW Disability Innovation Institute. She teaches current and future teachers how to best support students with disability in their classes. She also works on many research projects. Julie Loblins, OAM, is an adjunct lecturer at the School of Education at UNSW Sydney. She is a co-researcher working with Eva on many research projects. Julie is also a board member of Self Advocacy Sydney. And last but absolutely not least, Sky Sarkarat is a team leader for the Leadership and Peer Support Program of Self Advocacy Sydney. She's also an, an ambassador for kinship, supporting other parents and carers of children with disability. And now I'm going to hand over to the Gene Equal to team for their presentation.
Thank you very much, Jackie. And just checking that people can see my slides okay. Fabulous. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, we're delighted to speak on behalf of the whole team. And here is our website where more information can be found. You also may like to follow us on Twitter or on Facebook. The slides are made using easy read principles with an image on one side and small understandable chunks of information on the right. We acknowledge photo symbols, which we have a license, we um, license from them to use their images. And also we wanted to highlight that all of our resources and publications that we discussed today, you can find them on our website, www.geneequal.com. And in particular, we'll be talking about our educational toolkit, which is on the New South Wales Centre for Genetics Education. And we wanted to acknowledge the funding from New South Wales Health that has helped the work that went into making this toolkit possible. And handing over to Eva. Thank you, Emma. So the reason why we decided um, to do uh, our work in Genequil is that we are acutely aware of uh, very, very bad healthcare uh, provided to people with intellectual disability. And we know that um, over the, um, not just in Australia, but globally, people with intellectual disability uh, experience uh, twice as much avoidable death twice as much emergency and hospital admissions and experience many physical and mental health conditions. Um, they also have lower rent, uh, rates of preventative health care. And this is well recognized by the National Roadmap for improving the health of people with intellectual disability that really focuses to uh, uh, rectify the situation. And just to give you an example or an insight on how poor the healthcare is, um, it really uh, it is equal to healthcare provided to people in Sudan. Uh, that's that's uh, that's the healthcare in Australia for people with intellectual disabilities. So we decided that this needs to change, and Gene Equal is part of this initiative. No productions means doing research together. People with disabilities are included in the research project process. Um, Co-production can also help solve good challenges in healthcare. And we do have a good co-production agreement. So this slide is rather busy, but what it's doing is giving an example of how we've put the guidelines um, from the DIIU in action. So the doing research inclusively co-production in action guidelines can be downloaded from the DIIU website. And it really talks you through six steps of how to do co-production in an authentic and meaningful way. And I'd highly recommend this because prior to Gene Equal, I was a complete co-production newbie and I found it so helpful to follow these guidelines and hopefully we'll bring them to life by showing how we've done that with our Gene Equal team. So over to Sky next. Uh, co-production and inclusive research is about partnerships, respect and trust. This is our wonderful Genequil team. We're from, um, we come from a, we come from a few different um, backgrounds like disability education and healthcare backgrounds. And if you want to know more about um, our team, you can visit our website. So, uh, what we uh, what we did initially was that uh, we conducted interviews um, with 19 people with intellectual disability and nine support people. Um, and people were incredibly open. Uh, they talked about some good experiences with healthcare, but mostly about bad experiences with genetic healthcare. They highlighted that there is lack of easy read information that is available, and they really don't understand what's happening at the appointments or what should be happening after. 
And they also talked about how healthcare professionals need better educate, education on how to engage with people with intellectual disability. So we've first of all heard that this was an important topic for people with intellectual disability. And so as we were moving forward in the co-production um, pathway, we really took the recommendations and what was told to us to really focus on those top priorities. So about making information in easy read about genetics, which was not available anywhere else in the world. And also to shift the needle in healthcare by providing education to health professionals. And as a health professional myself, I think it's really hard, you know, easy for us to beat ourselves up. But the honest reality is this is not a focus in most medical or health curriculum so far, which is an absolutely big hole. And we at Gene Equal together thought that it was so important to actually work collaboratively with healthcare professionals to give them not only the resources, but also the skills and the knowledge to help do healthcare that uses reasonable adjustments, is person-centered and trauma-informed, but coming back aligns with the recommendations and priorities of people with intellectual disability. So over to Sky about what we did next. We co-researchers uh, add our experience on things like easy read ethic documents, recruitment plans, how to run interviews and focus groups, and much more. We bring our lived experience. We are accessibility experts, and we know what will work and what will not work. We ran um, co-production uh, and advisory workshops together. Co-researchers co have, uh, we have uh, trust, trusted partnerships with disability organizations. Julie facilitated these meetings and uh, everyone, had, everyone res uh, had respect, support if they wanted support and a voice to speak up about things that matter to them. Um, so the educational toolkit is now live and has six videos which is about how to not how not to practice healthcare, um, ha healthcare. Uh, sorry, uh, healthcare and five videos, uh, five five easy read booklets about genetics, tips and resources of healthcare professionals. Thanks so much, Guy. So these are our videos, and you'll see we um, brought in some incredible actresses for the videos. You might see some of that amazing acting coming up. And just like Sky said, we took two scenarios. So we looked at something which sadly is actually the lived experience of people with intellectual disability. So they were fictional, as in they weren't um, completely something that had happened, but they were based absolutely on the experiences of people with intellectual disability and as us in the health professionals in the team recognizing similar types of experiences that we had had but from a healthcare professional perspective and then the second way is we filmed the same situation but where we put into place the healthcare professionals in that scenario put into place the recommendations that came from people with intellectual disability and hopefully the sound will work and I will be able to play you an example of that. So the first one is a clip from one of our videos showing the current state of, um, of healthcare, so how it should not be. And please let me know if the sounds work so, okay. So, you know, it'd be good if we could, if I could get information about all Jess's problems from you before oh. the doctor comes in. Um, perhaps if we could start with, you know, whether she met her milestones growing up, you know, whether she was delayed walking, talking, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you know, how she went at school, um, how severe her intellectual impairment is. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It has been very difficult for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, she has been impaired since her childhood and mm -hmm. she didn't even go to school with normal children. So, and what we did at the end of that first video was ask people to reflect how would they feel 
if they were in the shoes of that person in that appointment. So how would they feel if they heard those words being used about them that they weren't normal? How would they feel if they were sidelined and not even asked a question in the appointment? And with the person that was there to support them was also using that deficit-based language. So then I'll play you an alternative scenario, which is the same situation, but using the recommendation. So, you know, if I can advance my slides. Okay, here we go. And really, the most important thing is that you feel comfortable. This is your appointment. Can you tell me what you'd like to get from the appointment today? Uh, um, I want to know why I have a disability and some health problems. That's a great question. And look, I can't promise you that we will find an answer. Um, I can promise you that we'll try. <laughs> um, also, in genetics, it often takes us a long time to find answers. Um, so we, we definitely won't have an answer for you today, but I, I'm happy to explain to you the process, what's involved, um, and you know, keep you informed the okay. whole way. Okay. The other thing is to help us find answers, one of the things we do is ask a lot of questions, but it's important that you feel comfortable. And if there are any questions that we ask that you don't want to answer, that's fine to say no. So in that short clip, hopefully you can see a different type of healthcare, a type of healthcare that I personally want to be a healthcare worker within. It's one which is about partnership, it's one which is about trust, and it's one which is about respect, which also is the principles of co-production. Um, so I think what we're really talking about is co-healthcare as well. And, um, and Julie, I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you, Emma. So we have developed six different easy read booklets um, that you can see on the screen. The topics in the booklets was raised by people with intellectual disabilities from our co-production workshops. And people wanted to be able to know about making a complaint. This is also an example from inside our booklets and how it is an easy read example. Thanks, Julie. And we also wanted to acknowledge the New South Wales Council for Intellectual Disability that we work with really closely on making what we think are pretty beautiful booklets. Um, so this is what the toolkit looks like when you go onto the New South Wales Health website. We worked extensively with the Centre for Genetics Education, HETI, to really get the look and the feel right and with lots of consultation with the intended end users as well. So we really focus down on three key principles, which is when we got that list of recommendations from people with intellectual disability, we put them around three main principles, making reasonable adjustments, ensuring genetic healthcare is person-centered, and practicing trauma-informed care. So with that first principle, I think this is one of the most important take-home messages that we're trying to get across to healthcare professionals is we are in this country a signatory to the UN um, Declaration on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And there is a Commonwealth Disability Discrimination Act and there is relevant legislation in each state and territory that says that healthcare services must make reasonable adjustments. So it's not an optional extra, it's actually part of our healthcare policy. And what that means is changes to the existing way of doing things to ensure that a person has appropriate access to a healthcare service. Um, sorry, Emma, can I just yeah. interrupt you? Absolutely. Um, I just wanted to be able to say that also um, mention that making reasonable adjustment is not happening. 
Mm. Um, it's an issue when asking to have reasonable adjustment um, and just having extra time to see a healthcare worker is um, something that doesn't work well. Thanks, Julia. It's a really important point. And I know it's something we've talked about in our group, that even it's there in health policy, it's not happening. <laughs> even though it's on a poster on the wall in the clinic, it's not happening. And even when you go and show as a patient the policy, it's not happening. So even though it's there, I guess what we're trying to say is it needs this really big rethink about how we actually put what's in policy into place. So thanks, Julie. That was such an important comment. Thank you very much. And this is the kind of thing we talk about. If someone was Chinese speaking, we would not have a healthcare appointment booked for them without an interpreter for their language. And it's the same when we're thinking about people with disabilities. They need to have the appropriate communication aids and supports, which means that that clinic is accessible and understandable. So, for example, many people with um, higher support needs use um, augmented and assistive technologies. That might be, for example, an iPad. So it's really important to ask, how do, how, how do you like to communicate or how does this person like to communicate? And make sure that those things that make them um, a part of the consult are there in the clinic with them. And so a lot of that is about preparation. It's about planning ahead of time and giving people choices and options. And Julie, this is your point, wasn't it? Enough time. It is so critical that we're giving enough time. And that is an explicit reasonable adjustment that is in, for example, New South Wales health policy. So that may be a double length appointment or a series of appointments. And this is the type of thing we were talking about, which is the quotes from the interviews and the focus groups that Eva and Julie did. And people recognize that this is really important to be inclusionary. I'll now hand over to Julie, who is our person-centered expert to talk about person-centered care. Oh, and Julie, you're on mute. It's usually me. <laughs> Sorry about that, I forgot that I meant. Person-centered care is about listening to the person's likings, their needs and values of people who get health care. It means working in partnership. Most important, it's a process that comes from the person, focuses on the person, and ensures genetic healthcare is person-centered. Well, you couldn't say it more beautifully than that. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think this, this photo tells a lot. You know, this is often what we hear and what we see. The appointment is happening between the healthcare professional and the support person, but the actual person it should be focused off is left out. Um, so let's have another little video um, to, to on this point. Do you have a list of questions that you wanted to go through today? Because I really want to make sure we're focusing on what you want to talk about. Yeah, we made a list of questions. Oh, super. Yeah, okay, is that, is that in your folder? Here. Oh, here. Yeah. You got yeah. it. Brilliant. Okay, fabulous. So let me just pull up as well. I've got it on the computer. So what did you have at the top of your list? What was your most important question? Um, so I wanted to know how many people have this condition mm -hmm. and how can I meet them? Okay. Okay, what a great question. All right. So I have to admit something to you, which is I have never had a patient with CLCN4 before, but that is okay. It's a rare condition and I've got lots and lots of patients. In fact, one in 12 people in Australia have got a rare condition. Okay, so although they're individually rare, there's lots of them. <laughs> and so that's really normal for me, that's, that's okay. And what we'll do is we'll just learn about this condition together. Okay. Do you have a, do you have 
So hopefully that's showing a different way of doing things when the focus is on the person. And Eva's now going to talk about a really important last principle. So the last principle is the importance of a person, uh, sorry, for of trauma-informed care. Um, and before I uh, go into this topic, I would like to make a trigger warning because we will be talking about some really bad experiences of people with the discrimination, neglect, and indeed abuse. So moving uh, moving forward, um, we, uh, why is practice uh, practicing trauma informed care so critically important? We know from research that uh, people with intellectual disability experience trauma much more commonly than uh, um, any other population. Um, we also know that there is a very common experience of, um, of abuse. Um, in fact, and, and the numbers are uh, shocking, but, uh, but sadly uh, correct. Um, for example, 60 to 90 percent of uh, girls or women experience uh, sexual abuse during their lifetime. So uh, it is really important for healthcare pr professionals to, to come to the appointment and I, I would say expecting that there might have been an experience of trauma that they don't want to even worsen and really uh, practice the um, care that is that is based on trust, building rapport, uh, getting to know your patient, preparing them for every step, um, and being being very respectful. Uh, on this slide, you have some of the disclosures that um, Julie and I heard when we were doing interviews with people. There were disclosures of um, sexual abuse, but also, for example, financial abuse. Um, often uh, done uh, by somebody in the family. The very important thing uh, that we would like to also highlight within the uh, trauma-informed practice is being mindful about language we use about people because language really matters. And Julie, um, Julie can confirm that when we talk to people in the interviews, um, most of them, with one exception, Will, will tell us or told us at some point, I know I'm not normal. I know something is wrong with me. And of course, that's not the case, but that's the language that, that, that people with intellectual disability hear about themselves. And I also, also um, very often highlight this to teachers that I teach um, uh, because I hear them talking in front of the students um, about students in support units and normal students. And again, what's normal, isn't it? Uh, and very often we hear these terms also used by, by family members because they are just so used to professionals using them. And of course, if we, uh, we, we, uh, we keep on using these words and people start to believe that, that they are not enough, that they are less than others, then we are also preparing a perfect victims for abuse because they will not speak up. These are the conditions of people who took part in our research. And, um, and you know, I was really shocked to even uh, uh, read the word mental retardation among the uh, diagnoses. But you can see that a lot of terms are focused on uh, words like deletion, insufficiency, abnormality, um, retardation so it's a very negative language and it's not a surprise also that most of the people did not that we talked to did not, did not even remember their uh, condition and uh, gave us the reports um, on the contrary they told us i'm not a number or labels are for jar but not for people and there is a great guideline uh, that you can uh, find on the heti website about uh, language uh, and about the terms to avoid and terms to use instead. So, for example, uh, not to talk about as a genetic counselor with your patient who has intellectual disability about a risk of genetic condition, uh, because you know what's the message that you are giving to people that that it's a risk that their child has a disability is it risk means the, something wrong um, and of course it's it's not so rather maybe chance would be a good word 
Um, be also careful with using the abbreviations about disability. For many people with intellectual disability and their supporters, um, this is very, uh, very offensive um, because they feel dehumanized by that. So these are just sort of little tips about the language. And um, here's an example of someone actually taking the time to build that rapport and use more positive language. Hello, you must be Jess. Jess, I'm Jackie. I'm a genetic counsellor and I'll be with you for your appointment today with Dr. Bella. This must be Mary. Yes. We spoke Hello. on the phone. How did you go getting here? Was your trip in okay? Well. Thank you. Thank you for the direction. Oh. That's all right. Thank you for coming in. I hope the traffic wasn't too bad. It was okay, well, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, look, not much fun sitting around in the waiting room. So if you'd like to come through to the room where the appointment's going to be, we can wait in there for Dr. Bella and have a bit of a chat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, Jess, you get to choose who you would like in with you for your appointment. Would you like Mary to come with you? Yes. Okay. So lovely to meet you. Um, so we're now listening to feedback from people with intellectual disability through a focus group, healthcare professionals, through interviews and a survey. And Manjeka and Chloe are students who lead this work. Thanks, Guy. And um, here's what people with intellectual disability have been saying about our toolkit. Today's workshop was a really wonderful opportunity to hear the voices and the feedback from people with intellectual disability on some of the co-designed and co-produced Easy Read resources that we made in the videos. And we got some absolutely amazing feedback uh, and really just some new ideas what we can do further. I think this is a very, very helpful guide to help people with intellectual disability to access mm. the right help service for them. It's, it's very, very easy to read. Mm. It's very, very easy yeah. to read. It, it, it has uh, all the um, the key um, information, but it's a, like it, it, it's a guide to uh, talk talk with their patient to um, at, at a um, like the, the same uh, rate for yeah. uh, as them in, in an uh, easy to understand. Um, um, conversation. People really valued having both videos, that doctors should see both videos together to model some alternatives and strategies that they could use to make healthcare better. Another one of the key things that came out was that the videos are quite beneficial as well for people with intellectual disability and their support workers. Just to highlight what is better healthcare practice and what kind of care that they should be receiving and to empower them to get that care. I didn't realise just how much I conformed to the first video. Yeah. And once I saw that, things have started to change. Heard how I got booked to get support from yeah. for when she wanted somebody like, um, to have the same condition and everything. Yeah. And guided her and said, I oh, can go to Facebook and this is the website as well and gave her information. And, and I appreciated that the, um, the doctor complimented Ted. Just yeah. on a great question when it was oh, asked. Yeah. It could be trained, uh, like a compulsory train yeah. in that. We were pretty, pretty pleased with the feedback Today's that we've been getting. Um, we've also, as mentioned, that Sky told you Chloe's been doing interviews with health professionals and a survey will have some links at the end of this because we really want to hear from as many health professionals as possible what they think. And also one of the main messages we're hearing, it's, we designed this for genetic health care, but it actually has a much broader reach outside of genetics. Um, and Bronwyn from Australian Genomics has been helping us um, behind the scenes. And it's lovely to see that we've got actually the toolkit accessed by people all around the world. And we're being invited to speak, aren't we, at conferences around the world too, which means I will hand over to Sky to talk about that. Um, talking about what we learned together, we have done lots of talks together. We have made 
easy read announcements, easy read newsletters, videos, and podcasts about the toolkit. Thanks, Guy. And Julie. Thank you. So we've talked about co-production and what it means for our team. We've also ran co-production workshops, a number of them, I think at least three, um, with groups of people with disability and intellectual disability. We love getting feedback from our workshops. Their information gives us important information so that we can actually make a lot of changes to what they're suggesting. Um, and we talk about that in our meetings as well. Fabulous, thank you. And things that we would have never thought of, Julia, I think like um, comments on the images yeah. and what they mean to people that, that we would have never thought of. So it's so helpful to get that feedback. But as this next little video will show you as well, what I think I hadn't realized is how empowering the co-production process is for the participants in those workshops as well. Um, but I will stop talking and let you hear that um, from those people directly. It's great that we were all included in the process of the development of this book because not only you know, we gave our, our advice on how we how the easy read, but it also benefited us too in receiving that information about Gene Eagle and what it's about and uh, how it can help us. So just, just knowing the, uh, the yes. impact uh, yeah. and, and how many and how many people can help us with today. And this is what Gene Eagle is about. Yeah, it's sure. making things better. Yeah. Did you have any more thoughts on that, Julian, about co-production? Um, yeah, I love, I was just going to comment that I love how people like to have a say. Um, and sometimes it's really hard because there's lots of hands going up and you've got to look at um, who's actually going to be talking. Um, so that's great. But it's also great um, when we got to write things down on butcher's paper and be able to um, look at that and type it up and really think about um, what we really need to work on. So, yeah, great feedback. Absolutely. And um, I must say that Julie is the best facilitator that I've ever worked with. And a lot of that is about that trust that you have with people, that people really understand that what they say is valued and that you give everyone a chance to talk. And yeah, you're so right. It's amazing to be able to um, go back and revisit what people said so we can really pull out of that some ideas for where we want to go next. So, Julie, I think this is some points that you wanted to make about what co-production means to you. Yeah, so it's about doing research together working alongside staff at university, looking at what you actually want to actually take part in in the process. Um, it's not about doing everything. It's about looking at your skills and working on... Um, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, just making sure that research and people with disabilities are being involved with it. Um, it's about playing to your strengths and Eva and I love playing to our strengths. That's what I was gonna say, yeah. Um, so we look at what we're going to do when we work together. Um, and one of the things that's really important to be able to say is sometimes that actually takes time. Mm. Um, nice words. In looking at something um, than we think. So I'll hand it over to Eva so that she can talk about co-production. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, and I think while we are now here reflecting about the co-production is 
It's uh, something that gets often forgotten by research team. We are really quick in moving to the writing what we found out and sharing it, but we don't take the time to stop and reflect and think what uh, what went well in our team, what we can improve. And so we've made a really big point in our team to make spaces uh, just on discussing this process. So when I was reflecting on the uh, what co-production means to me, I honestly ca can't imagine doing research in any other way. Um, and um, I love it because it really allows us to, to focus on what is important to people with disability, not what is uh, important according to, you know, some ideas that researchers might have. And it really empowers all people who are involved um, uh, equally, uh, academic researchers, researchers with disability, we learn from each other. And it challenges you and what you're seeing. Often we think that we have a solution for things and then we are proven very quickly wrong. I was just thinking about the co-production workshops. How many times Emaska and Julie, we went there with this idea that this is really good, solid, easy booklet, people will love it. And then it was torn apart, but always with such a great ideas that made the product better. So, yeah. So I will pass on to Sky. Um, so I think it means uh, respectful. Um, everyone, everyone is very respectful. It's very inclusive. It's very empowering to everyone. Um, and we're we're all learning together, like what um, um, what Julie was saying before, and um, like playing to our strengths and things. Um, and making changes. Um, this this is um, this is making changes with the people with um, lived experience with the intellectual disability, um, and and also um, researchers and academics and um, healthcare professionals um, and educators. It's really um, it's really it's, it, when everyone's view is that it's really when um, it really makes a difference. Thanks, Sky. So I kind of stole your idea here in that respect was like the top one for me. Um, what that actually means to me is um, also say what Julie said, it takes time, okay? So if, if you're coming in, as I think I've definitely been guilty of as a researcher in the past, you come in, you've got a very tight schedule, you ask a question and you go away. And that's not how you build respect and that's not how you build trust. And to me, I got into healthcare because I health equity really meant something to me. To me, if I've got a wonderful advance in healthcare that I know can save lives and it's only available to a very small number of well-educated people in the cities, then I'm not doing my job. So co-production is about how we bring everyone together, how we're open, how we come and hear, because health service sucks in many ways. And we really need to hear the perspectives of the people who are missing out at the moment. And they've got the ideas and they've got the recommendations. And then we go with that. And to me, that's how we're going to shift the needle. Um, so Julie, some beautiful, happy news to end with. <laughs> Definitely. We are now going to not only do New South Wales, but go around Australia for the next five years. So this is a bigger project. Um, it will include people from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Um, it will... It's going to be from the National Health and Medical Research Centre. But most importantly, it is going, we are going to be able to get to interview lots of people with intellectual disabilities who have been through this and not been through this, as well as interviewing parents, families, support people, and healthcare professionals. Thanks, Julie. So we're wrapping up at the end of our presentation. Just really invite you to come and explore our website. 
we're pretty proud of it. We've put a lot of effort into making that as inclusive as possible. And a thanks to the DIIU actually for some seed funding that helped us. Um, and those are some QR codes so you can have your say. Let us know what you think about the toolkit. And you can do that with a little quick survey or by having a friendly chat um, to one of our team. Um, and we're very um, open to any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks to um, the rest of the Gene Equal team, my uh, co-team members, for that uh, brilliant presentation, brilliant set of presentations, um, and telling us all, uh, telling everyone about the, the work, an immense amount of work actually that's been going on over the, the past few years. And now it's time for questions from the audience. And we, we have one already, but please feel free to send in more. They'll be handed on to me to ask. Um, shortly. So the first question um, is a, a, a about how the team can account for people with uh, intellectual disabilities who are who are non-verbal, who are non-speaking in, in all of this. Um, Eva gave a direct message through the chat um, talking about techniques of body mapping and, and photo voice. So we wondered if you could uh, perhaps say a little bit more about those and about other ways as well. Um, so we have been using um, uh, very successfully with people who have very limited uh, communication skills or do, do not use verbal communication arts-based methods, uh, particularly body mapping, where, where you use a body line of a person and they can express their thought and experiences by drawing, writing, putting uh, pictures on the map uh, to, to share with, with you their experience or photo voice when people communicate via photo, uh, photos of the things that they prefer or, or do not like. And of course, there are many other, uh, many other opportunities. Some people uh, use talking mats. Some people use um, different communication devices. So uh, it's definitely possible. And as, as uh, Julie said, it takes time. And it takes even more building trust and, and relationship with the person. So it's not about just coming somewhere, uh, meeting a person who doesn't know you and trying to do such a method. It would be probably very scary and not understandable information uh, like situation. So it's really important to do it safely and respectfully, engage with the person, get to know them, have a few meetings before you engage in a, any of these methods. And sometimes we also have to go through information the participants' um, information sheet um, before talking with them beforehand. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Um, there was another question here about which it was touched on, I think, uh, in in the in the presentation, but maybe amplify uh, a little bit uh, now. Um, it's, obviously, the work in Gene Equal has been focusing on, as the name suggests, you know, genomics, genetics, and so on. Um, how about its importance in other areas of health? Whoever wants to take that one. Um, I can maybe start, and then we'll see if anyone else has got some comments. So, um, I think that's really strongly coming through. So, obviously, we did the toolkit about genetics but you could almost take the word genetic out of it mm -hmm. and it's apply applies to really every healthcare clinic appointment because every part of healthcare needs to be accessible and inclusive and respectful and trauma-informed and be person-centered and really be a partnership and involve providing people with choices and being person-centered. And personally, that's a big shift that mm -hmm. I think has to happen. So it needs to go from a healthcare where our health professionals are the experts, we have our own language that's often in Latin, <laughs> <laughs> and we have our own schedule mm -hmm. and it's on us. That means that there are so many people that are missed out because they don't understand, they don't really feel that this is something that they feel safe. They're 
would sit and have a medication prescribed and then go and rip it up and never take that medication because it's never been explained to them why and that it's safe and to actually go through their questions. And people won't take up on screening programs if they don't feel safe and they don't see the benefits. And so I think to me, it's almost like we've taken one of the most complicated <laughs> potentially um, parts of medicine and we've really broken it down. And I think if we can conquer this, we can conquer all of healthcare. But I'd like Julie and Sky and Eva to comment. Um, does that make sense to you guys? Oh, <laughs> definitely, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And I honestly think that um, when I watch like the engagement, like the videos, take one and two, I can so see how it applies to teachers. And how they engage with students or uh, you know social workers so there is actually uh, so much that can be then translated even beyond health thank you and I, I mean i i can remember if i can make a comment myself um my my dawning sense that this was not something that it's a, you know, it's a cliche, but this is not something that applied only to people with intellectual disability, but obviously there's not a, um, a two, two groups of people, but almost everybody, me including, have difficulties sometimes navigating the healthcare system, uh, understanding why you've been prescribed a particular medication and so on. We often make things way too complicated for everyone and making sure that this is accessible to everyone benefits everyone and not just a proportion of, of the population. Absolutely, Jackie. And I mm. honestly, for the example, the materials like Easy Read, it's so critical. And our whole team, including you, uh, took a training mm. in uh, Easy Read. And we that's how we write things in our team. And it is so much easier. I prefer it so much than reading all those long, wordy documents that often don't make much much sense so uh, as you said mm -hmm. it benefits everyone um can i also do a shout uh, emma and maybe uh, and maybe you can talk to that but we want to encourage healthcare professionals to be inclusive and person-centered and trauma-informed and so we have introduced uh introduced our award oh that's a good idea yeah so and actually this came completely from i think our workshop this came mm -hmm. as an example so Sometimes it can seem like we're kind of, you know, bagging <laughs> healthcare professionals a lot and they don't do this and they don't do this. And people in our participation workshop said, well, hang on, my GP is brilliant. You know, she does this, she listens to this, you know, she really makes me feel valued. I understand things. So we thought that's a great idea. So we have an inclusive practice award. Um, so you can nominate anyone that's done some great um uh, healthcare where they've really made people feel included and they've felt respected and you can email us at the gene equal team and we will then present an award via email to that doctor um, and we've got our first one up on our website and and that was a doctor outside of genetic healthcare it was a surgeon but he did absolutely brilliant healthcare and we really want to celebrate that as well um, and on our website, you can sign up also for our newsletter and you can read more about the Inclusive Practice Award and other things that we're doing, which I think are really positive. Um, so I, I do want to, to bring that. I think this is, you know, like it said at one of the videos, it's about making healthcare better and making things better. And that's that we really take that strengths based approach. And also our social media pages, Emma. Yes. So <laughs> we've been a bit slow to come, but the junior members of the team and Sky and Julie said, you guys need to be on Facebook. So we're now on Facebook, Instagram, <laughs> not quite TikTok, but we might be there soon. And possibly also the thing that used to be called Twitter, but no longer is the founder. <laughs> Showing my age there. Um, we're nearly, that was a really nice way to end. We're nearly at the end, but we do have a few more minutes uh, which, which, to, to ask questions. And there is one that's come up here, which I'd like to throw at you, which is a quite specific one about how do uh, you promote the research and programs 
that you use to find people with intellectual disability to participate in your co-production research, for example? If I can start on that one, um, it doesn't work that I would work into some grassroots organization like Self Advocacy Sydney without people knowing me and mm -hmm. me knowing them and without having really mutual beneficial partnerships and collaboration. So uh, um, that, that I would be viewed as a taker and not really be uh, be trusted. So it's it, everything stands on the long established relationships with uh, with grassroots organizations, mm -hmm. and um, and the trust. Uh, and then of course uh, Julie is fantastic um, person when it comes to recruitment. Um, uh, but but yeah, without trust, it wouldn't happen. I also think. Another thing we think is really important is appropriately um, remunerating people for their time. So mm -hmm. we follow the New South Wales Consumers Forum guidelines. We've written that into every grant and, you know, really hats up to New South Wales Health and the NHMRC. There was no issue with that. So we've put budget items saying this is how much we need to be remunerating. So paying for people's time because they're often giving up half a day to be part of a workshop, a full day even. And we need to make sure we're paying and appreciating people because it's one thing to say we appreciate you. But then if you're asking for people's time for free, that feels a bit hollow. Mm. Excellent point. Em. Now, uh, I'm, I've got another question here in the last two minutes, which is uh, probably going to be one that you have to field in another direction or for another time, because it is, do you have recommendations or learnings for other researchers about how to make co-production processes more accessible and safe for people with intellectual disability? Are there perhaps guidelines that you can point people towards? Yes, uh, we would definitely recommend the uh, co-production in action guidelines created by the Disability Innovation Institute. Uh, they also are available in Easy Read, and we have been uh, using them not only to guide the actual process, but also for learning about uh, about research in our team. So um, these are really great guidelines. Thank you. And that was a shout out for the DIIU as well. So thank you very much um, for doing that. Um, I know that there will be other questions. Um, and Izzy is putting uh, in the in the chat links to the guidelines uh, where people can find them on our on our website as well. Um, that people do have other questions, but we are coming very close to the end of our time. So if possible, um, Julie. Guy, Eva, Emma, we might well have you back at some point in the future to continue with this conversation uh, with the outside world. But just for now, uh, can I thank you all very much for being with us uh, this afternoon? I'm sure the audience appreciated and also our Auslan interpreters as well. Thank you. <laughs>